Hey, I am Charlie Saccarelli, and if you're watching this, that probably means that you are excruciatingly bored because you have watched every webinar that is already available and you're really scraping the bottom of the barrel for education right now. So here we are. Um, I thought I would jump in and participate um, just in case you had run out of episodes of Tiger King. So um, this is made uh, during a time of uh, difficulties for optical and teaching and everything. So this is uh, during the coronavirus um, pandemic. And the one thing that I've noticed is a seismic shift in life um, that I'd like to kind of share with you. So this is kind of normally how I look at life is I look at all of the things that there are to do. You have the important and the not important and then the urgent and the not urgent. So normally I try to stay in these quadrants, the quadrants one and two. And then if I find myself hanging out in quadrants three and four, I try to figure out what, um, what I can do to get out of there. Um, those quadrants have changed a little bit with this whole um, pandemic to um, this, which is, uh, I mean, the, the main thing that um, that I have really cherished is um, the lack of a need for pants on a given day. So that's really cool. And uh, you will notice that I will not be standing up during this presentation. So today's uh, thing is called uh, Creativity and Ophthalmic Opt. And I am kind of into glasses. Um, I own Chadwick Optical, which is a lab that makes glasses, and I'm pretty much obsessed with them. So what I'm going to be talking about is the exciting world of ophthalmic lenses. And this is what excitement looks like. Those are lenses. So I'm going to start it with lens finishing um, before I go into lens surfacing, and then I'll talk about some of the weird stuff that we can do with glasses to make them functional for patients. So this lecture um, is both ABO and COPE. So I don't know because this is not me visually and in, in person teaching a class. I don't know if you, the reluctant and unfortunate watcher of this video is an optometrist or an optician or somebody else. Um, but this is for an optometrist is why, why am I talking about this? Cause somebody else does the glasses and, um, the term optician is watered down significantly depending on what state you're in. So an optician can be a highly trained professional. It can also be a dude who worked at Burger King the day before. And at this point it can also be your telephone. Um, your iPhone has a lot of functionality that can in many cases, re replace some of the very basic tools of opticianry. So when you, when, a, when an optometrist writes a script, they don't necessarily know where that script goes. Does it go to a highly trained professional? Does it go to a dude who worked at Burger King last week? Or does it go to um, the internet? So because all of these things are potentially opticians, this is why we're talking about it, because somebody needs to know about the glasses. And if you are an optician that is the highly trained professional, um, when I talk about opticians in any kind of derogatory way, I'm not talking about you. You're cool. But as an optometrist, traditionally, the idea is that you would do a refraction and then the refraction just, you know, gets turned into a pair of glasses, just kind of like magic, right? Um, so it's not really like that. It's a bit more of a path that is less linear. So eyeglasses after refraction have all of these different potential variables introduced. So some of them are the aberrations, which um, can be dependent on the lens material. They can also be dependent on the curvature of the lens that is selected to manufacture the prescription. Uh, there's also a whole lot of relevant measurements that factor in. So if, if the refraction is done at a different distance than the glasses are made, there's a compensation that should be made. There's also a lot of different frames. 
lot of different lenses, um, a lot of different functionality that can be added to lenses that completely changes potentially the prescription. And if the optician that you're sending to is one of this guy, one of these guys, they're not going to factor in all of those things. So what can happen is you come back, you receive back a pair of glasses that looks like it's made perfectly and it matches your refraction, but the patient says it doesn't work. So we don't, we don't want that situation. Um, but that is the situation that we are often faced with, with a lack of knowledge in opticianry. So I'm going to talk next a little bit about finishing, which is the act of putting uncut lenses, so these big circles, into a frame. So you take a lens, you take a frame, and then you make a pair of glasses. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that process and how that works. And I apologize for this red dot hanging around, um, but it might be kind of fun. I think there was like a whole children's book about seeing spot. So we can um, make that kind of like a side game within the training if you get bored. So the finishing process consists of a few different parts. So the first thing is to actually get the shape of the frame. And then figure out how to orient the lens in the frame. And then after you figure it out how to orient the lens in the frame, then you put it into a machine that actually cuts it to make it what you need. So I'm going to go through each of those processes in a little bit more detail of how each of them work. So I've been making glasses since I was uh, like my crib. My crib was literally in the lab. Um, so I've, I've been doing this a little while, but uh, my, my math homework was actually regarded regarding to finishing. I would calculate decentrations and seg drops uh, when I was seven and eight. Like that was my math homework. So tracing to capture the shape of a lens, you have three different ways that that's typically done. So old school, like way back in the day and still a little bit today with like drilled rimless shapes is you have a pattern. So what a pattern is, is a plastic piece that is just the same shape as the lens that you're going to cut. Now, that was kind of annoying because at my lab, um, we had walls of patterns. And that was a little bit tedious to keep track of and sort. So the next thing that came along was this, which was a tracer. So what the tracer would do is you would put a frame in between these little um, parts here. And then a little stylus would come out and it would trace the inside of the rim to capture the shape. Now, the downside of that sometimes is that if you had like an oblong frame shape, the stylus could end up warping the frame shape. So you had to be careful of that. Now there's something that's actually really cool. This is called a shape finder. So this is from a company called the MEI. They're, they're kind of like the people that that's the company that's kind of bringing finishing um, to the next level. And they've been doing that for a while now. But what they've done is rather than tracing or using a pattern, what they will do is actually take a picture of the lens and capture the shape via a photograph and capture it um, with accuracy, capture the circumference almost perfect. So once you capture the shape, the next thing that you need to do is um, put something on the lens to hold the lens into the machine. So to do that, you need to do some calculations. Um, the one thing's called decentration. So that was, um, that was my math homework is basically you need to figure out how much to move the lens so that it sits in front of the eye. So back in the day, you would have to, you would twist those little knobs on that machine and place the lens over it. And then you would um, use the little lever and apply the block to the lens. Um, that got a little bit fancy. So this actually, this stole my seven-year-old job, um, is this does the math automatically. And then now, so this is the block that actually gets applied to the lens to hold it into the machine. But now there's, there's, a, there's a lens a machine called a no-block edger. So what that does is actually uses suction cup. And that has a built-in lensometer too. So like the whole process is completely automated on these no-block edgers. And automation is super cool 
um, but it also comes with some side effects. So, and then we go to edging. So edging, you have a patterned edger, and what the patterned edger does is you plug that plastic piece into one side and then the lens into the other, and it just matches the shape of the pattern. Now the pattern list edgers, those would use the shape of the trace, so that file that was created by the tracer with the, with the stylus, and utilize that. Now this machine, these five axis CNC edgers, let me back up a little bit. I'm so, did I mention I'm recording this at night? So I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm fading quick, I apologize. So the pattern edger, the bevel, so the, what the bevel is, is, is basically you have the groove inside the frame and then you have the bevel, which is the little V that holds the lens into the frame. So when you have the V that holds the lens into the frame, you want that to track the lens a certain kind of way so that it fits into the frame nicely. So the pattern edger, you had um, a couple options. You had two, four, six, or eight, and that represents the base curve. So you could cut the bevel on one of those three curves and that was it. The patternless edger, it would trace the edges of the frame and then give you options. It would say, hey, do you want it one third, two thirds, like one third to the front, two thirds to the back, or do you want it all the way along the front or all the way along the back? So you could, you could really modify that um, some. And now the five axis edgers have a fully customizable bevel that you can even tip and you can do all kinds of neat stuff with. So all that said, which one of these machines would cut an Oreo cookie? with no questions asked. Would it be the patterned edger, the pattern less edger, or the five axis CNC edger? And the system to cut an Oreo cookie with no questions asked would be the simple thing where the machines are not too smart. The machines are super dumb and they'll do whatever you tell them to. So that would say, okay, why would you want to cut an Oreo cookie to fit a frame? Wouldn't the bevel be crummy? So it's a metaphor and what that metaphor is is that, okay, we can do weird things with old technology that new technology is too smart for. So there is still a place for the old stuff to get the really weirdness done. So that's finishing. And now from finishing, let's talk about lenses and how we make lenses. So uncut lenses, how do we make those? That is the next part. So the first thing that we want to figure out when we're making a pair of glasses is what kind of lenses do we start with? Because we have two processes. So we have finished lenses. And what finished lenses are is lenses that are pre-made with power. And then we have semi-finished lenses where the front surface is a fixed surface and then we grind or surface the back surface. Now, the benefits of finished lenses is they're the simplest way to make eyeglasses. So if you wanna make glasses in 20 minutes, 30 minutes, you pull a finished lens and you can cut it right away. Um, there's actually, there's tons of lenses available as finished lenses. You can actually get up to a minus 14 sphere in a 174 in a finished lens. So the single vision options are, are extravagant. Um, you can get uh, polycar, uh, you can get transitions, you can get, um, you can get transitions, you can get all the different kinds of AR, you can get all the different materials, um, but it's mostly single vision. So once you get into a situation where you need axis dependency, like, uh, like a polarization or a progressive, that's when we start needing to get into the surface lenses. So, the, the idea to when you can use a finished lens is you need the power available. Um, you need the lens treatments that you want available. So if you, you need your, you know, if you need a photochromic with AR, you need to find a finished lens that's photochromic with AR. And then the next thing is the proper lens size available. So the proper lens size, the way you calculate the proper lens size, we're gonna get into that a little bit. Um, so the way you calculate the minimum lens size you need is going to be two times the monocular decentration plus the frame ED. And then, um, depending on uh, who I'm talking to, uh, let's talk about what an ED is, how it's measured, and who you should call if it lasts longer than four hours. So, how do you measure ED? So, ED is called the effective diameter. So, it stands for effective diameter. And what it is, is 
two times the longest radius from geometric center, which is really boring to say and think about, which is why I put a picture of old people in a bathtub. So this I graciously stole from my friends at Laramie K because this is something that I share with my staff and everybody who will listen all the time because this is how you do frames. So what the what the what the what a frame what an ED is is number one first you need to find the geometrical center of the lens. So what the geometrical center is is half of the A, so the midway point of the A. So what the A is, is the width across the lens. And what the B is, is the height of the lens. So you find half of the A and half of the B, and that is called the geometrical, geometrical center. And um, point out for Laramie K that there's uh, a missing R there. Okay, now, how do you measure the ED? So from this geometrical center, you want to take the longest distance from here to any edge of the frame. So what we would do is look all the way around this frame and find the longest edge. So that would be from here to here. And we would multiply that times two. So that is the effective diameter. Now, a lot of, a lot of people learn to measure it from here to here, which is not the way to do it. So the way to do it is geometric center to the ED. Now, also a lot of times there's, if you look up with the frame manufacturer, the information about the ED will be part of their, um, part of their, their knowledge. Like if you just go on a company website, a lot of times the ED will be part of the frame knowledge and you are better off using their number than you are measuring it yourself. Um, because it's, as you can see, kind of, uh, uh not, not, not difficult, but tedious. And uh, if they've already done the homework for you, yeah, might as well go with it. So the other thing, so what we said was we have monocular decentration. So what's monocular decentration? Is the distance that the center of the lens needs to be from the geometrical center of the frame. So here we have the geometric center. And here we have the optical center. Now, optical center is um, a controversial term in opticianry because we don't have much else to complain about. Um, so here's the optical center. And what this is, is the decentration, the distance from the geometric center to the optical center. So what the optical center of the lens is, is the spot where um, light passes through without, without diffracting, without, without moving at all. Now, the reason the controversy between, behind optical center is that, okay, well, what if I have a prescription with prism in it? Well, then it's not the optical center of the lens, right? So the, the way that it's referred to now is usually called the, um, my, the major reference point, so the MRP. So, um, but anyways, the distance between this and where the patient's eye is is called decentration. So we want to take the monocular decentration times two and add it to the minimum frame size. So just to nerd out a little bit more on this and feel free to fast forward until I'm done this part. If you're not feeling it, um, it, it does, we move on past this and it gets less boring in a little bit. So the first thing you need is the frame PD. So what the frame PD is, is the A plus the DBL. So you got, this is the 56. That's the width across the frame. And then the DBL is the distance between the lenses. That's, that's called the frame PD when you add those two together. So if you have a frame PD of 76 and a patient PD of 76, the decentration is zero. So if you have a 62 millimeter ED, zero decentration, and a 75 millimeter lens, you're not going to have any problem with it cutting out. So this is the frame. This is your minimum blank size. This is the lens. Now, if you take that same lens, and now instead of the patient being a 76 PD, now they're a 66 PD. Now the center of the lens moves over in the frame. And now we're gonna have more closer of an issue. Now the other important thing to recognize is that look at the edge thickness. So when you move the lens over, the lens gets thicker. So you want to pick a frame that is smaller, for high minus prescriptions and not a lot of decentration. 
that keeps the edge thickness down way more than doing high index. Now, if we make this patient's PD even a little bit narrower, now it's a 56. Now we have so much decentration that the lens won't fit in the frame. So that's why it's important to know the minimum blank size or the minimum lens size before going into finishing. Now, for, so that's for minus lenses. So minus lenses are thin in the middle and thick on the outside. So when you cut them, the thickest point's always gonna be on the outside and the smaller you cut it, the thinner it'll be. Um, now with plus lenses, the size matters because it can be too big or too small. So let's look at that a little bit. So if we look at, so it's kind of like Goldilocks. So now we have a plus three with a PD of 62 and a 55 ED. So we got 55, yeah, whatever. That's a lot of math here, right? Okay, so this is 72 minus 55. Son of a I'm gonna back up. It's too late for math. And I don't know how to use WebEx that good. So I'm just gonna leave this be. These numbers work out if you wanna pause it and do the math yourself. Anyways, this lens is too small for this frame with her PD. Now this lens, if you take that same PD and now you take a bigger lens, now that lens is too thick. So if you've ever seen a pair of glasses that somebody got off the internet and they're like, say they're a plus three and then their edges are really thick, that's because the finished lens that they used was too big. Now, if you use one that's just right, after you calculate the lens size, then it looks good and you can use a finished lens. <sighs> Sorry, that was rough. So what are the benefits of finished lenses? Number one, they're way cheaper. So they're mass produced in countries where people ride tricycles on airport tarmacs. Um, and if you have an in-house finishing lab, you don't need anybody else. You can just kind of keep a stock of lenses, cut them and make glasses really quick. So now what happens when you can't use a finished lens? So now what? So say somebody wants a special tint or somebody wants um, polarized sunglasses or something like that. Now what do we do? Now we move into the world of semi-finished lenses. So what a semi-finished lens is, is the front side of the lens is finished and the back side is thick. So what these end up looking like is they start out kind of like hockey pucks. And um, so for polarized, for flat tops, for progressives, um, typically we would want a semi-finished lens to begin with. Now, if you want lenses for like Plano Sunwear, they make Plano polarized lenses coming out the wazoo, but um, if you want a prescription with a polarized lens, you're gonna have to get it surfaced. So what are the cool things about semi-finished versus finished lenses is, remember the whole thing that I talked about with decentration and making the making sure the lens was the right size? When we surface a lens, we can put the MRP wherever in the lens that we want. So the size of the finished lens doesn't matter. All we need to make sure is that the semi-finished lens is bigger than the ED. So the math is a lot easier and then our, our, our calculation system takes care of the rest of the math. So you can grind prism into semi-finished lenses. So if you have a Plano with a couple of diopters of prism or a low prescription with a couple of diopters of prism, you can grind the prism into the lens, um, which makes it easier. So a few other cool things about semi-finished is the plus lenses, we can grind them to the perfect thickness for the frame. So we can grind them down to a nice edge versus if you, um, if you try finished lenses, a lot of times your edges will be a little bit thicker. Now, this is uh, my tip to you as a lab owner, is that uh, a lot of times, because we know that people don't measure EDs correctly, we usually add a little bit of fluff to the lenses to make sure that they're going to be just the, so that they're going to be thick enough, because we don't want a lens returned because somebody says, hey, you made this lens too small. And then we have this debate about them not knowing how to measure EDs, and we don't like getting into those debates. So normally we add a little bit of extra thickness to cover our butts. Um, so if you send a trace, we don't need that. So that's um, just a, a word to the wise that that can lead to a more aesthetic pair of glasses is making sure that you send a trace 
to the lab or send a frame to the lab. So how are semi-finished lenses processed? Like how do we cut the back to get you the prescription you need? So there's two different ways. I'm gonna talk about each of them separately. Um, the first one we'll call traditional processing. And we're gonna continue this meeting. Um, so traditional processing, you have two curves. Two curves, you have your sphere curve and your cylinder curve. And what we call them is a base curve and a cross curve. So the base represents the sphere, the cross represents the cylinder. So what we cut, we cut it onto the generator with the two curves, you have your base and your cross. And then we fine it, which is um, what that is, is a sanding process, base it more or less, using a hard tool to smooth the rough cut. And then we polish it. So I'm gonna show you that with pictures because me describing it's kind of boring. So this is the traditional process. So my equipment's a little bit different than others, but for the most part, the result is very similar. So the traditional process is we start with the semi-finished lens. We use this machine, which is called a blocker, to apply a block to the lens. So the block can be either wax or alloy. Um, and we, we actually have some of each for different functions. But so this is wax. And then this wax blocker, this, this block helps hold the lens into the machine. So then we take the lens and we mount it into this machine, which is basically a high-speed router. Um, so if you look at that, that thing, that thing spins about 30,000 RPM and cuts the lens surface to a semi-smooth surface, um, but nothing that you would think about putting on your face as a pair of glasses. From there, we take that lens with the semi-smooth surface and we take this lap. Um, so what this is, is this is a, a hard tool that has both the base and the cross curve built into it. So we run that on these machines, which are called toric, uh, toric polishers or toric finers. And what those do is they spin around in circles, um, not the same circle, but it spins around in a various, uh, various number of circles for a few minutes and smooths the surface. So after the surface is smooth, it looks a little bit like this, which still doesn't look like anything you could see through. It looks better than this, but nothing you could see through. So from there, now we take it, we take that same tool and we put a polish pad. So what the polish pad is, is kind of like a, a suede-ish material or a velvety type thing. And then we apply that and polish and voila, we have a lens that you can see through. So that's cool. And that's the traditional process. So now that's, that's how we were doing it for a really long time. So that's how we were doing it from, you know, when I was born. More recently, now the process has become what's called digital processing. So digital processing, I'm gonna talk about digital processing and then freeform processing. So they run on the same machine, but they, they work in two different ways. So what digital processing is, is it is smooth cut with, using the base and cross curve. So it still cuts the two tools, but now instead of using a hard lap tool, it uses a soft tool. So that results in better conformance to power standards. So these machines will cut down to a hundredth of a diopter. And then the polishing is more of just like a, a little bit of a touch up. Now freeform, is rather than cutting just the base and the cross curve, now the lens is cut using what's called a points file. So what a points file is, is basically if you picture an Excel spreadsheet and it's 100, 100 values across this way and 100 values down this way and every single box is filled in, that is what a points file is. And what that does is tells the, it basically creates a map of the lens and tells the machine, hey, cut this map on this lens. So with that, we can turn the semi-finished lens into anything. So we can turn it into backside progressives, we can turn it into aspheric lenses, um, we can turn it into round ads, and then we can add another cool thing called lenticularization. <coughs> Pardon me. So this is the digital process. So we have machines from a company called Schneider Optical. They're out of Germany. 
And um, the first step is we apply a block. Now this time, rather than a wax block, we're gonna apply an alloy block. And the reason for that is that this machine cuts with a lot more precision than our other machines. Due to that precision, we need, the alloy is a much harder material and it stops the lens from flexing while it cuts. So this alloy blocking is imperative to have a smooth, um, good quality optical surface in this, um, with these machines. So the first step is similar to the other machine. It's a rough cut. And then it does a smooth cut using a lathe, which is just like a round blade. And then a third cut, which is a diamond cut, which leaves the lens almost perfectly smooth. And that, then we just dump that into the polishing machine and it goes for a couple of minutes and out comes a lens that you can see through. So before, when we did all traditional processing, every combination of base curve and cross curve would need its own tool. So if you go from, you know, your average person, like your minus three to plus three with cylinders from anywhere from zero to four, you have thousands and thousands of tools. Um, so this was 25% of my lap inventory. Um, now it's in drawers because we don't use it that much, but it's, it was just a massive amount of stuff. Now with digital processing, now we use three tools, one, two, three. So every seven minutes of process time, these get recycled, these, uh, these go away. So each of the processing methods have their place. So the, the cool things about traditional processing is it allows us to break out our inner um, mad scientist. So just some of the things that we've used in conjunction with these traditional processing machines to make lenses work is uh, Play-Doh, PVC pipe, pipe cleaners, rubber bands, shoe strings, heat shrink tubing, toothpicks, and or precision cut post-it notes. Now, never rough cut post-it notes. They must be precise. Now, the cool things about traditional processing is that we can cut curves up to 30 diopters and more, and uh, occasionally we can go on to both sides of the lens. So we've actually done up to like a minus 55 before. Um, in addition, you can do prism up to 20 diopters or more, cylinder up to 20 diopters. The only, the only kind of mental limitation is how thick the semi-finished lens starts. So the, pretty much anything that you can refract can be made. Now, whether or not the patient will be able to see out of it, that's a whole different ball of wax there. Now, the cool things about digital processing, so the powers are cut to a hundredth of a diopter. So before, if there was any lack of calibration in the generator, it would be pounded out by that metal tool running on the machine. So if there was anything, it would, if there was any errors in the generator, it would be overridden by the, the finer and the polisher. Now all the precision is built into the generator and all the polisher does is go. So in theory, powers can be made much more accurate since the generator is cutting the power into the precise amount. Um, now, most labs will eat up the, the ANSI tolerance by not measuring the front curve of the lens. So when we have lenses, the, the, basically what creates power in a lens is the relationship between a front curve and a back curve, right? So if your front is one curve and your back is another curve, that's what essentially creates the prescription. So by, and what manufacturers will say is, hey, this is the curve of this lens. So they make, they make thousands and thousands of them um, using the same tools over and over, the tools wear, and eventually those aren't quite right. But that doesn't mean they wanna stop making them. Um, but what happens is sometimes the tolerance, you'll, they'll tell you that a curve is a 6.2 and this curve is actually a 6.26. So that is like 0.06 of tolerance if you don't correct that up front. So it's just, just something that is a thing. Now, the cool things about freeform processing is that we can do what's called digital compensation and aspherosity. So what digital compensation is, is have you ever worn wrapped sunglasses? Or have you ever worn a pair of glasses that just has too much face form to it? And basically, um, you feel like you're in a fishbowl. So if you want a quick example of what 
it's like to look through a curve that's wrong, take your glasses, put them upside down, and look through. And what you'll see is that, yeah, okay, that's my prescription, but if I look to either side, like everything's kind of wonky. And when you don't make glasses on a proper curvature, that is what you experience, is the, the amount of oblique astigmatism. So what oblique astigmatism is when you look through a lens at an angle, that oblique astigmatism is basically um, a, a variation of what the prescription should be because it changes when you look through that angle. So what digital compensation is, is when you have a wrapped sunglass frame, they will modify the prescription for each individual position of gaze and optimize it, optimize to minimize the oblique astigmatism at all the different places that you can look. Now, so that's super cool. And that's something to consider on anything with a wrap really is that digital compensation. And then the other thing is that we can make the back surface of any lens whatever we want. So what that, what that leads to is some pretty cool stuff. So this is a little bit more on this digital compensation. So when you look through a normal kind of wrap sunglass, you, when you look certain directions, you have massive amounts of oblique astigmatism. And when we do the, uh, when we do the digital aspheric, it's not like that. Let me get back a little bit to, um, we can put, we can make the back whatever we want and we can put it wherever we want. So this is lenticularization. So now remember, this can be any lens that we want. So it can be a flat top, it can be a progressive, it can be a polarized, it can be really anything. Because we're processing the back of the lens, the front of the lens, anything that's available can be used. So what, what lenticularization is, is if you take a high minus lens, the lens gets really thick as it goes out, right? And your average person, 90% of their eye movements are 15 degrees or less. So basically anything outside of 40 millimeters is never really used for acuity. Now that's not to say it wouldn't be bothersome because you know it's kind of like looking through this in a way, um, which can be kind of bothersome. But aesthetically speaking, what we can do is thin the lens with lenticularization so that it's optimized for the optical component and then it's also optimized for aesthetics. So if you have a patient who's insistent on a bad frame choice, like they have a big head and they want a big frame and they have a minus eight, something like this can help, um, help aesthetics and keep the optics going. Now that's on minus lenses. So on plus lenses, we can do the same thing. But the one thing about plus versus minus is that minus, we have the back curve and we have the back curve. And the back curve never actually changes. Now on a plus, you can see, okay, hey, we have a concave back surface. Now we have a convex back surface. So we can do the lenticularization and we can make the most beautiful lens that you will ever see that reads in the lensometer as exactly the power you want it to be. But the patient will put it on, they'll put on this beautiful pair of glasses and they'll say, hey, I can't see through this. Um, so normally we only try to do the plus lenticularization on new wearers. Um, now this is, this is to use the plus lenticularization to thin the lens. Um, as long as the curves can be kept good. So this, I guess this is an extreme, this is an extreme version. So this would be like a plus 10 where the curves would go backward. Um, but there are situations where the plus lenticularization will not sacrifice your curvature, but just, this is a warning that there is a possibility that you will be sacrificing optics when you use lenticularization. Plus lens. So what I was saying earlier here was that we can make the back whatever we want and we can put whatever we want, wherever we want it. So let's talk about that a little bit more. So we can cut round bifocals onto the back of any lens. So what if that starting lens is a flat top? And you say, instead of a normal 50% intermediate, want, for some reason, you want a plus one up here and a plus three down here. Well, we can do that. So we would cut a round that's a plus one, use a plus two flat top, and voila, you have a plus one with a plus three trifocal. Now there's two different ways we could do that. We can cut the round over the flat top or we can cut the round under the flat top. That's kind of a choice of personal preference and I would, I would uh, 
talk to talk to us or talk to whoever about how to do that um about what the best what the best idea is given the patient's usage of the lens so based on based on how they'll be using the lens like if they're more if they read more um i would probably put the flat top down here if they use the computer more i would put the flat top up here <coughs> um also a big thing with round bifocals. So round bifocals are available up to like a plus twenty. So they're 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 available for all kinds of wild stuff. But um, the side effect of a round bifocal is you have a massive, especially when you get into higher power. So say you have a, a need for a plus five flat top, um, and the the patient or the doctor or whoever is insistent on polycarbonate as the material. So the polycarbonate flat top is only available up to a plus four add. So what we can do is take a plus four add flat top and cut a plus one round on the back. And now you have a plus five add custom bifocal. The other thing that we can do is custom progressives. So for occupational use, we can cut a progressive onto anything. We can cut a round onto anything. So you can do occupational rounds, you can do uh, flat top on top, progressive on the bottom, trifocal on top, progressive on the bottom, round, round on the top, progressive on the bottom. Um, we've even done some stuff where you have maybe a golf seg over here with a progressive. Uh, there's, you can do pretty much anything. So that. Now, the other thing that is, um, this is something that we do and have done, though, it's kind of on the edge of whether or not it's something that should be done. So a lot of times we have patients and doctors and anybody who insists that they want things a certain way, no matter what. And I hate saying no. So if it is possible, I'll give it a shot. So this is something that we've discovered um, that is a thing that works in theory um and we've had some success with people wearing it but it's something that you want to think long and hard about before investing in it as an idea so there's there's an idea that you can't get a progressive with an ad higher than a four or an ad higher than 450. um but we actually discovered this by accident because we wanted a minus two and then we picked the wrong lens and then it came out as a minus three and we're like Oh, golly. So what we realized at that point is, oh, wait, we could actually harness this to do this challenge. So if we tell the machine that it's cutting CR39 in a 450 ad, but we actually load in a 1.74 index into the machine, now we're going to get a lens that's way stronger than is recommended. So... If you wanted a plus three with a six add, we can tell the machine that it's making a plus two with a four add in CR39, load in 1.74, and end up with a plus three with a plus six. So when I was um, when I was first going through this um, presentation, this was the slide where my wife fell asleep. So this is just, uh, like I said, I'm not recommending it, but it's a thing. Now, the other thing that exists is these, which is there are small run custom lenses from a company called Airlight Optical. So Airlight's um, a company in Georgia that makes anything you want as long as it's an uncoated CR39. But they'll do base curves up to a plus 50, adds up to a plus 20, everything in between. They do, um, they do some stuff with uh, massive like slab-ons built into it and that sort of thing. So they have just an incredible array of lenses available. Um, it's all on their website, kind of the availability. So they have some golfer segs and they just have all kinds of cool stuff. So if you're ever like, Hey, I want to nerd out on lenses and just see what's out there. That's a really cool, um, company and website to check out. So the other thing that we can do, and this is, it's, it's funny because of how often we get the question, like, can this be done? And, um, so just to give a little timeline. So I think seven, sometime in the 1700s or 1800s. Um, ben Franklin invented bifocals by basically gluing two lenses together and having one of them be his distance prescription and then the other one being his reading prescription. 
Fast forward to 1960 something, and we put a dude on the moon. Fast forward to now, and a lot of people think you can't do what Ben Franklin did in the 1800s, which is glue two lenses together. So we still have that capability. That's not, not a thing anymore. Um, it's just uh, less popular than it once was, but it's still a possibility. So common uses for splicing lenses is when you have different horizontal prism needs between distance and near. And that can be small amounts or it can be big amounts. So this would be a function for bigger amounts. The other thing is, um, the other function is when you have maybe an add power or something that is not available. So for instance, if somebody insists on having transitions in a plus six add, um, we could make that using this Franklin technology. Um, the other things that you can do with the, len the splice lenses is a, a trifocal. Um, or um, this is a thing for sometimes a patient will have a kind of contingent double vision where, hey, my vision's double if I look like this. Um, so if the vision's double contingently, um, you, can, you can potentially put prism just in a part of the lens. Um, the other thing this is occasionally used for is uh, visual field loss. So I have another lecture um, that talks about that. So this is the kind of before picture of when you're about to glue the lenses. So what we would do, so basically you, you edge them like normal and then we cut them down and then we polish them, glue them together. And then you have a magical pair of glasses with different amounts of prism base in or base out. Um, and then the next thing is, so if you want to accomplish base in prism at near in another way, in a more easy way, what we can do is use a flat top bifocal and i call this basically fudging the near pd so if you look at a flat top bifocal a flat top bifocal has two optical centers so the first optical center let's change the terminology again okay so major reference point one and let's call it a major reference point and then a reading reference point so Say your prescription number one is um, a plano, and your near is a plus three with one and a half diopters of base in. So if you have a PD of 6360, here's plano, right? And here is plus three. So this is plus three at 60. Now, if we take a flat top and we shift the center of the flat top in towards the nose, now this can be the same spot, can be a plus three with one and a half diopters of base in. So what we can do is by shifting the near PD in by five millimeters per eye, we can create the prism that we wanted. So if instead of saying, hey, it's 6360, we say it's 6350, we can create one and a half diopters of base in prism. The other thing is laminated lenses. So what that is, is just gluing lenses one on top of the other. So that's a thing. You can glue lenses one on top of the other. So you can glue a circle on it. You can glue a flat top on it. Um, another thing, this is a lens that um, was originally designed for RP. Not particularly effective, but um, because there's not much for retinitis pigmentosa, it's, it's uh, widely known and taught about because it's the only thing that seems to exist. Um, so what this is, is a channel lens where this is the main lens. And then this is one, two, three. So you have a base in prism, a base out prism, and a base down prism all glued onto the lens. So basically when the patient uh, looks in any particular direction, they can get uh, potentially what would be considered field expansion, even though it doesn't really play out that way. Um, the other thing is embedding stuff into lenses. So, um, so this is a pie prism. So what this would be is you would basically cut a quadrant out of a lens and then glue a prism into that. That would be a thing for quadrant anopsia. Um, once again, uh, not necessarily, um, check out the other lecture I'll be doing on, on homonymous hemianopia just to talk about these solutions. And then this is, uh, you can uh, put a prism and embed it into, into the lens. Um, that, was, that would be called a, a button prism, and it was originally many years ago patented by uh, Dan 
got leave. Um, but I think the patent expired. So the other thing to consider for task specificity is that there's a lot that you can do now with this thing called a chemistry clip. So what a chemistry clip is, is um, here, I'll see if I can close up on the camera because I just see that this picture is a crap, uh, crap quality. So if you look at this lens, there's a little button on each side. And what that button is, is a magnet. So that has a corresponding magnet in the clip. And what that does is clicks on to the pair of glasses. So what we can do is, I mean, so that company is called Chemistry and they have really cool stuff. Um, but they don't have everything. So what we've, what we've done with the chemistry stuff is said, okay, what else can we do that would be possibly task specific? Um, so one of the things is uh, we can put peripheral prisms on the glasses. Um, we've also done some basin prism. We've also done uh, the popular FL41 filter for migraines and then another uh, blue filter for uh, concussions. So we can do... Um, we can do a lot of different stuff with a single pair of glasses and add a lot of functionality there. The other thing that we've done with chemistry clips is um, a lot of patients with hyperphotophobia, they'll have indoor um, tints that are like darker than a sunglass and then outdoor they want even more. Um, so this would be a situation where we could tint the base lens in the frame and then we could also add an additional tint. So traditionally we can only tint down to about a, a two or three percent light transmittance. But when you stack a two or three light per percent light transmittance on top of another two to three light percent uh, transmittance, now you're getting down into the dark levels of, of almost a welder shade. Um, also, if you don't like the magnets, um, Aspects Eyewear has, um, has clips that can be customized with your own um, stuff as well. Some of their clips have barrels, some do not. Um, if you have them on your board, you can take a look. So um, this is me screaming um, that somebody needs to know about this stuff because you as an optometrist, you as an optician are going to face really weird situations where the patient knows what they want and you have done everything that you know how to do and it doesn't seem to work. So because of the absence of a lot of, uh, of knowledge in opticianry, uh, it's important to at least know something and to know that your patient's not crazy. I guess that's the main thing is knowing that your patient's not crazy. So we don't want this guy to be the guy that knows about this stuff. He doesn't. So this is this has been a Charlie Saccarelli uh, pantsless webinar, and um, if you ever have any questions about any of this, this is my name, this is my email address, this is my cell phone number. Feel free to call me, text me, Facebook friend me. I'm super lonely, super desperate to talk about glasses because my kids and my wife are done. And thank you so much for listening to me for however long this was. Ciao.